my fellow Dream Chasers and Disney fans across the world and welcome to the latest episode of Kingdom of Isolation where in times of trouble why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney. It is the penultimate film in our road to the Renaissance period as we head to Victorian London with Basil the Great Mouse Detective released in 1986 based on the book series by Eve Titus. But of course it wouldn't be the Kingdom of Isolation without having a guest on board. He was with me for the previous episode covering the Black Cauldron, which you can see in the top right of your screens. It is the Dr. Watson to my Sherlock Holmes, Mr. Alan Sunter. Yes, folks, <laughs> Basil of Baker Street was inspired by the Sherlock Holmes stories. Yes, and um, the name Basil itself comes from who is the guy who is to many the definitive Sherlock Holmes, Basil Rathbone. Rathbone, yes. Um, I don't know who my favorite Sherlock Holmes is. I like um, I like Rathbone. I love Peter Cushing. Uh, in fact, probably actually Peter Cushing might be my favorite just because of how awesome in general Peter Cushing is. <laughs> yeah, fair play. And and then you and then you've got and then you're gonna have like sort of like. Um people of this generation that will be more uh, in tune with Benedict Cumberbatch's... Yeah, or, or maybe Sherlock. even Robert Downey Jr. Oh, yes, from the Sherlock Holmes films with uh, Jude Law, I believe, mm -hmm. as what as uh, as Holmes, uh, Watson. I've heard um, the show Elementary is also pretty good with uh, Johnny Lee Miller, I want to say. I could be making that up completely, but... <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. So anyway, Basil the Great Mouse Detective. This, I say, th this film, uh, this film came out just over about. Um, so just double check. Uh, it came out a few months after. Uh, it, it came about. It came out about a year or so after uh, the Black Cauldron, which was uh, mixed reviews from the critics, and it was a it was a box office bomb. So, uh, but from from initial thoughts, this was definitely a great. This was definitely a return to form for uh, for Disney. Actually, it was also the directorial debut of uh, two longtime Disney directors, John Musker and Ron Clements, who started off as animators before becoming full fledged directors for uh, a lot of uh, Disney's animated classics, especially during the Renaissance period, which we'll get into over the course of the summer. Uh, I'm mm. recording this on May nineteenth, folks, uh, and I'm recording this before I head to. Uh, my first trip to the cinema in what feels like an eternity uh, <laughs> to, to go and see uh, Tom and Jerry. And then tomorrow, May 20th, Mortal Kombat! Yeah, I really wish I could play the theme I really wish I could play the theme song, but you know how protective some, th some of these uh, companies can be with copyright. But um, yeah. And unfortunately, the cinemas um, still aren't open yet in my neck of the woods. Ah, but... unfortunate. Uh, wh which oh, next? Well. Uh, whereabouts would that be? A Dundee. Ah, oh, oh, that that'll be sort of like that'll be sort of like Moray, uh, Moray area, I would imagine. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, 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 um, or, or, uh, I elsewhere. checked a few days ago. the The only um, nearest si nearest to me cinema that's open is in Livingston. That'll be a that'll be a trek and a half. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't think I'm, I'm gonna do it. I'll, I'll just, I'll just stick to um, my Blu-ray copy of Zack Snyder's Justice League. I'll be fine with that. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that, that film's four hours long, folks. Yeah. So oh, like, I, it, it <laughs> if you're into it like me, if you're a big fan of it like me, it'll breeze by. Yeah, I was like, I was like, one, one of my friends said it is definitely worth the watch. Mm -hmm. So. Anyway, so um, so like I say, this is the, this is the penultimate film in the uh, road uh, to the Renaissance. The last episode on that road is going to be the next episode, which is going to involve Oliver and Company. Um, but yeah, um, I've, I've only got a, I've only got a handful of episodes left to record now. Once this one is uh, out of the way, folks. I mean, I say, I've definitely found. Uh, doing this over the last week or so, especially that I've found that I'm I've been very 
productive as far as getting these episodes put together is concerned. So I'm definitely spoiling you guys with plenty of Kingdom of Isolation content. And I'm going to be spoiling you with plenty more of that over the course of the summer with the Renaissance period. So, but anyway, uh, let's focus on seeing how this case unfolds as we go through Basil the Great Mouth Detective. Spoiler alert, in place if you haven't seen the film yet. So we get, so I'll say this, first frame, yes, first frame, right at the gate, you, the atmosphere, just like the, the lighting and the, the mist in that opening shot, London, 1897, which is going to be very pivotal in the narration after the opening credits. Um, you, it really, it really, uh, was it? The atmosphere of uh, Victorian London is captured right out of the gate with this first frame. Mm. And then after that, we end up in this toy shop with uh, the Flavishams. You've got uh, Olivia Flavisham, voiced by Susan uh, Palachek. Who's apparently from uh, Glasgow. Yeah. Yes, and uh, yes, the uh, the Flavisham mice, they are from Scotland. Uh, not sure whereabouts specifically, but given given the um given the dialect from from those two, I would imagine probably somewhere maybe Edinburgh region, possibly. Yeah, uh, that that seems about right. Um I in, when I was doing um, my research, I found that um Susan uh, Polachek got the role of Olivia due to her sincerity and naturalism in, in the performance. And yeah, I can agree with that, especially ah. impressive considering she recorded it when she was eight years old. That is definitely very impressive. And uh, her dad... Uh, was by Alan Young. Yes, um, uh, Hiram Flavisham. Uh, now, Alan Young does have a... Um, uh, a pretty good resume on his end. He was known as he was let's say, his best known role in the world of uh, Disney was, of course, Scrooge McDuck for over <laughs> thirty years. Incredibly, and he his first role as Scrooge McDuck was in the Oscar nominated short Mickey's Christmas Carol. Just three years before this film was released and he's also of course been... in that one he wasn't yep. called scrooge mcduck he was called the actual name of ebenezer scrooge, ebenezer scrooge yes let's say let's say the mickey's christmas cow it's it's a great short it's a great telling uh, say, it's it's a great um it's a great telling of the classic charles dickens um uh book a christmas carol i think the, yes. the fact that they're able it's... to do that so no, no, I was just going to say it's um, many people's introduction to the story, and it's not a bad yeah. introduction. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact they were able to do all of that in about, what, 20, 25 minutes or so? Mm-hmm. And, then, and, of course, and, of course, don't worry, folks, when it comes to the Christmas carol, when it comes to Christmas time, I've, I've said it before in previous episodes, uh, the Christmas episode for this year is going to be the Muppet Christmas Carol. So that's <laughs> so there you go folks. That so that's that's going to be my Christmas episode for this year. The lot uh, the Christmas episode I did last year was of course Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Mm. And and that was actually the first episode uh for the for those that are newer to uh newer to this series. Uh that was actually the first time I actually started using clips from uh, from the film. <laughs> what the? Hello, Ogie. Okay. But but of course, but of course, I've got to be careful with uh, how long those clips are because, again, copyright issues. Yeah. But, but uh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say, oh, say, look at look at that. That yeah. Doesn't that image alone just scream like? Sherlock Holmesian kind of thing. There's always something about London in the fog that just instantly makes you think of, you know, Sh Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and 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 it's not hard to see why. I say, given I say, and 
and uh, I'll get I'll get into some of the references to the Sherlock Holmes material during this um, this episode. Yeah, because because there's a there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but um, let's say let's say there's um, as Alan Young did a lot of um, uh, projects as uh, Scrooge McDuck. Um, he, he's he's done a, he's done a fair chunk of uh, radio stuff uh, as well, including his own show, the Alan Young Show. Um, he was um, I say he's done Scrooge McDuck for a number of um, for a number of Disney's projects, including uh, including a classic uh, TV show that I'm sure you guys will all be uh, familiar with. I can't play the theme song because copyright, but uh, let's just say <laughs> Ducktales. Woo! <laughs> yeah and uh yes even scrooge mcduck ended up being part of the kingdom heart series of course he did yeah i was like i say like, um i was like the, mo- the most recent um appearance from scrooge mcduck in uh in the kingdom Hearts series was of course kingdom hearts 3 when he's helping when, when he's in uh Twilight Town, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, it is Twilight Town because it's Traverse Town. That's the f- in Kingdom Hearts one. Yeah, it's Twilight Town that first appeared in Chain of Memories towards the end of uh, Chain of Memories, and then like it was really prominent in Kingdom Hearts two. But in Kingdom Hearts three, uh, you've got Remy with his own little uh, bistro or restaurant, whatever, or whatever it is, and you've got Scrooge <laughs> McDuck outside just uh, relaxing and enjoying himself there. Nice. But uh, yeah, as I like to say, um, uh, was it Alan Young was uh, he was in Duck Tales, he was in Tailspin, and uh, he even did an episode of uh, the Batman animated series, which we uh, talked about previously in our Alice in Wonderland um, episode, as Todd Baker in the episode Baby Doll. So yeah, overall, like I said. Pretty extensive. Uh, I say, I say, another fine example of somebody that's got a very extensive resume, not just from pre, uh, not just from um, how much they've done previously, but also yeah. an a, an extensive resume from the Disney projects that they have been involved in. Yeah, Disney loves um, to use people who really know what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I say, and 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 that's one of the reasons why they, and that's one of the reasons why, as far as their casting is concerned for the voice acting stuff especially it's mm-hmm. it's more or less on point throughout every single film that they've done mm-hmm. but back to basil for the but back to basil for the time being um it's um it's it's, it's, a, it's a little present um uh, i'll just go with mr flavisham uh, he gives olivia a little um present i'm assuming it would be a birthday present i might be wrong yes it is um it is the um, it is a birthday present and it's yeah. uh, and it's um and it's this um it's this ballet mouse that uh, starts off as this uh flower that's yet to bloom and then while the music from um from that uh, fr- from that toy is um while that music's playing you see, you see this ominous figure, and then you hear this like this um, gravelly laughter, peg leg, um, and the music at this point as well, pretty foreboding. Mm. Um, but uh, let's say, and and it turns out to be um, turns out to be uh, Fidget, who is voiced. By if I can find it, uh, Candy Candido. Now I'm not sure if uh, Candy has done other works with uh, Disney. Previously. Yes, he has. He, um, uh, I remember he voiced the, uh, um, I think it was a, a, an alligator in uh, Robin Hood. The one who announces the long-legged stork oh. thing. Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, he's also. Yeah, he has done Disney projects previously. Like I said, uh, he was, he was also he was briefly, uh, he was, he was memorably. Blah, blah, blah. This is what it says on here: briefly but memorably 
was the voice of the angry apple tree in The Wizard of Oz way back in 1939. Mm. Um, he was also, um, he also did, um, he was also part of, uh, he was also part of, uh, yeah, he was also part of a film that involved uh, Abbott and Costello. Uh, in, in, he was the voice of a skeleton in Abbott and Costello in the uh, Foreign Legion. Now, now for me, in regards to Abbott and Costello, the most well-known um, sketch from Abbott and, Abbott, and, Abbott and Costello is that, <laughs> uh, how is it? Who, who's on first? Oh, no, th no that, that was, that was, that was, uh, uh, Animaniacs paid homage to that one. It's the, um, <sighs> seven into 13, 28 times. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, I've, I've lost count of how many times I've watched that particular sketch, folks. I was, I would, I was, it's one of those sketches that doesn't. I was, you you can like you can do numerous spins on it, mm. and people would still get what you're referencing. Also, if you um, haven't uh, seen it, I I highly recommend Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Mm. It's one of the best horror comedies ever made. Yeah, uh, there was also. Okay, there was also um, there was also one film that Abbott and Costello uh, were involved in that involved uh, the Invisible Man, one of, uh, one right. of Universal's um, OG uh, monsters. Yeah, and yeah. Um, the Invisible Man also makes a short cameo at the end of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, voiced by Vincent Price. Yes, and we'll get to Vincent Price shortly because he is one of the oh, voice actors will. in we this will. film. Yeah, let's say the, uh, the uh, one the, of the, the other. Uh, to Candy and uh, Candido, he. Yeah. Um, I also saw he voiced another character in uh, um, the Great Master Detective, and I think I know which one it is. I'm fairly certain it's one of the guys in the bar later on who yells at the octopus, "Get off, you eight-legged bum!" <laughs> ah, yes, one, yes, one of the one of the uh, side characters. Yeah, uh, Candido. <sighs> As far as some of the other projects he was involved in Disney-wise, he was the voice of the Indian chief in uh, Peter Pan. Long story short, that that particular part has not aged well in any capacity. No. Uh, one of Maleficent's goons in um, Sleeping Beauty, where they check every cradle. Oh, those goons, honestly, <laughs> living up to the name. Uh, he was also a deep-voiced prisoner in the Haunted Mansion ride. Basically, whenever Disney needs someone with an incredibly, like, gravelly voice, voice, just just get this guy. He'll, he'll nail yeah, it. Definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah. Fidget ends up capturing um, uh, Mr. Flavisham after bursting through the, uh, the shop window, giving us a pretty, um, pretty out of nowhere jump scare right out of the gate. Yeah, I, I thought Disney was done with the dark stuff after, <laughs> after Black what Cauldron. happened with the Black Cauldron, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, but anyway, it it does it does it. I say it's nowhere. Near, this film is nowhere no. near as dark as the Black Cauldron, but it does still no, have no, those no, no, dark no. elements here and there. Yeah, it's got a good balance of <laughs> dark and light. Yeah, absolutely, and then. And then, uh, and then once Olivia comes out of uh, the cupboard, she's you just hear her calling for her dad, and it's echoing throughout um, uh, the London streets as as we continue zooming out. And then we get that first instance of the theme for this film, and I I could not fault the choice of composer for this film, no. of course. The composer in question, one Henry Mancini. Yes, the same guy that did the theme for the Pink Panther. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 you and you can tell that there are like you can tell throughout the film that there are hints of um, the Pink Panther in the score throughout the film. Mm, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I believe this was actually Mancini's first fully animated movie that he did a score for. And he, he said that um, he felt he was obviously used to doing with 
it with animation because of the Pink Panther, um, the opening titles, but a fully animated one, he found it not difficult, but a little bit more challenging because he found uh, the pacing was a lot quicker than your, your typical live action movie. Yeah. And see, he's, um, he does, uh, he does have, uh, he does have a wide range of um, film soundtracks that he, uh, that he has done. Uh, everything from, uh, everything from the original Breakfast at Tiffany's to, uh, to like the, the Pink Panther films that involved, uh, I think it's Peter Sellers. I think. Peter Sellers, the great Peter, Peter Sellers. Peter Sellers. Yes. The, the OG Inspector Clouseau. And yes. Uh, uh, yes, Henry Mancini also did the Tom, the animated Tom and Jerry movie released in 1992, folks. Which, <laughs> unpopular opinion, I think is real. I think it's really. I I I I enjoy the Tom and Jerry film. Yeah, it's 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 not the worst thing that's ever happened to Tom and Jerry. It's it's decent. Yeah, I can I can maybe understand why some. Um, purists would be put off by it if, uh, you know yeah. you're always going to get that yeah mainly because of the fact that they talk in the film but yeah and also maybe because no, i don't know like i don't know if that movie was the first time that they went on this kind of uh big adventure where they're interacting with human characters and like actual of a bit of a dramatic plot in a way if you know what i mean yeah. maybe that was a bit of a I don't know, just it just maybe didn't feel right to some um fans, to some extent, which I yeah. get. Yeah, but uh, but but like I say, I, I I enjoyed I enjoyed the that Tom and Jerry film. Um mm. but uh yeah, so so once we have those opening credits uh, out of the way, we get the uh, narration from uh, Dr. David Q. Dawson, voiced by uh, Val, uh, well, his his full name is officially Valentine John uh, Betton, but he's uh, he's credited as Val Betton. Uh, he was previous uh, previously a soldier uh, in the Queen's sixty sixth Regiment in Afghanistan, and he's actually a surgeon at this. Um, uh, now that he's uh, left, now that he's effectively left the army. Uh, and he and his and his narration. Let's just say it's as if he's it's as if he's telling a story to the kids. Mm. And the and and the narration here at this point is uh, he's talking about the fact that it's the eve of uh, Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, hence or, the London 1897 thing. Yes, or or as um, uh, the mouse version is called in this movie, Queen Mouse Toria. Really pushing the boat out on the names there. Wait, what? Oh, the, the, what's the... oh my word, I didn't even pick up on that. <laughs> I did not even pick up on that. <laughs> wow. Uh, Queen yeah. Mouse Toria. Well, that just happened, folks. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but... Um, so, yeah. But... Uh, <laughs> Queen Mouse Toria. So Queen Mouse Toria's uh, <laughs> uh, Diamond uh, Jubilee. And, and uh, so Dawson, uh, now that he's left uh, the 66th Regiment, he's, he's, looking for, he's looking for accommodation in London. And Very this much is, like John Watson. Yes. And this is where, this is where he ends up coming across. I'll say, I'll say, and just, yeah. Th that's I say, this is this is this is one of the this is probably the first of like many references to Sherlock Holmes throughout the um uh, throughout the film and uh, that, that's that's one of the, that's one of the things that I really like about this um this is one of the things I really like about this film I mean for for kids especially it's in a way a great introduction to um effectively the Sherlock Holmes um. Uh, the, Sherlock, the Sherlock Holmes uh, stories format. Yeah, the Sherlock Holmes format in film form. form. <laughs> oh yes, I actually um, uh, found a quote by uh, Roy Disney, Walt's nephew and the ah, um, yes. vice chairman at the time. He said, 
I think mice are sort of in the family. We've just done mice all our lives, and I suppose we sort of are in love with them. Yeah, that, yeah, that that it it does make sense, and of course, uh, ma making reference to, of course, the iconic Mickey Mouse, who was actually going to be called Mortimer Mouse originally. Hmm. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and and Mickey Mouse actually uh, took over as uh, Disney's mascot from uh, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit after mm. uh, some um, copyright issues somewhat with uh, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit uh, and I believe Universal Pictures at the time. Mm. Well, I was um, doing my research. I also came across this really um, brilliant quote by Val Batten himself about Disney. Mm -hmm. He said, we're all Disney creatures, aren't we? I mean, there isn't a soul in the world who hasn't grown up with Disney. That's thrilling to be part of that tradition, that creative tradition. And let's just put it this way, I couldn't have said that better myself. Yeah, <laughs> and and Val Ben was a, a great choice to play Dr. Dawson in this. You can really feel his, you know, the yeah. his, his, his passion for working on a Disney thing in his performance. All Definitely. the performances in this movie are, are fantastic. Definitely. Um, let's say Dawson ends up coming across uh, Olivia. Um, and Olivia explains what, what's, um, what's happened. She's lost. She's trying to find Basil. And, and, and Dawson just, uh, in a way, a little unaware of why um, Olivia is lost until... He asks where her parents are, and then, and then that, and then that's when, in a flood of tears, oh bless Olivia, that I say, in a flood of tears, she says, "That's that's why I must, that's why I need to find Basil," and 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 Dawson, being being that kind parental figure, yeah, throughout the film. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for Olivia, um, she says, "Not not sure not sure where the parents could be or something like that." But he says he does know where Basil lives. So they head to Basil's place, and then we see and then we see the uh, the housekeeper, uh, Mrs. Judson, voiced by uh, Diana Chesney, and who is uh, of course a stand-in for Mrs. Hudson from Sherlock Holmes. There we go, folks. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I, th I think I might actually need to do. Um, I think I might actually need to do like a, a, a tally somewhere on the screen of how many references to Sherlock Holmes um, that we managed to point out throughout this uh, throughout this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like well, we'll we'll work, we'll work that. I'll work that out during the editing process. Oh but yeah, ne but nevertheless, um, also, uh, they get to they get to they get to Basil's address. Which which is also which is also where uh, like because because Sherlock Holmes's uh, accommodation is two two one B, and I th so it, it'll, it'll be it'll be something similar to that for uh, uh, Baz probably two two one and a half or something along those lines. Yeah, probably. Yeah, because I because we'll um so so see the clip the clip the clip rep. Uh, the clip from that particular point will uh, will um, definitely yes, yeah, that, that'll answer the question. Yeah, that'll answer that. Answer. But um, we'll say, they get to Basil's accommodation. We get introduced to Mrs. Judson. Um, we'll say, uh, is this the is this the um, uh, is, is this the is this the residence of Basil of Baker Street? And she she go. Uh, I'll say the first line. She says, "I'm afraid it is," uh, <laughs> and I and I actually put in here. Uh, it's as if she doesn't enjoy Basil being there, but she does like Basil. Don't get me wrong; she does like Basil. But um... yeah, she she's a cons like Basil is a considerably much better lodger than Sherlock Holmes was. I mean, the, there's the famous bit in the books where um, I can't remember if it's to solve a case or something, but uh, or maybe even just out of boredom. But Holmes um, takes a gun and just shoots the letters VR onto the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and that is in reference to something that happens later in this scene. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, 
Well, so, so some of the, some of the uh, contraptions that we see set up throughout this um, uh, th throughout the living room area. Um, I'm just. I always love that in the movie. I I yeah. love a room dedicated to all kinds of sciency stuff. Yeah. What does half of it do? Who knows? Who cares? It looks sciency. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, gee, Rube Goldberg much? <laughs> it's, it's, it's just just the con just the convoluted ways of doing like simple tasks tasks like uh, uh smoking out of uh, uh the pipe that's attached to the uh, the device and then you've got these and then you've got these boots doing like these um uh, footprints on uh bits of paper mm -hmm. and and then oh and then uh we, we we hear this voice outside, and then he bursts through the front door. I shall have him! And what on earth is that costume bounce as well? Of course, but at this point in this film, at this point, we don't know that it is actually Basil underneath that um, costume. But um, and, and then Dawson questions, who on earth is this guy? <laughs> it's, <laughs> as it's, you would. Yeah, in a way, it's a very foreboding entrance. Uh, yeah, from, like uh, the, from the door bursts open, we see him and a flash of lightning behind yes. him, almost as if he has a sinister intent. Yeah, but uh, but despite that, uh, but despite that, he, he, he comes across very gentlemanly when he's introducing himself, because this is where because this is where we actually see Basil himself on screen uh, for the first time once he comes out of his uh, disguised voice by. Uh, voiced by Barry Ingham, who um, this looks like it's his only um, Disney themed uh, project that he was uh, involved with. But uh, he has done he has done a couple of um, he's done a couple of things with uh, Doctor Who. Uh, he was in. He was in the uh, the Myth Makers uh, story in 1965, where he played Paris, and he played Aladon in the uh, film Doctor Who and the Daleks. Uh, he was in the Sweeney. He was in the. Um, so he's he's done he's he's made appearances for like one or two episodes here and there for like various shows. He was uh, the Avengers, uh, the A Team, Murder She Wrote as well. Uh, Star Trek Next Generation, and he also did a TV movie adaptation of the Jekyll and Hyde musical, where he was Sir Danvers Carew. So just quickly scanning through his uh, filmography, it, uh, this is his only role in a Disney uh, project in some capacity, be it TV show, film, or otherwise. But mm. He, like, there was, there's so much to go through as far as this, uh, as far as uh, Basil himself is concerned, yes. and how Barry uh, portrays him. I like, think the introduction comes across very gentlemanly, and then, and then you get that, and then you get that, like, uh, that cocky, arrogant uh, side to him. Uh, I say he, I say he goes, he goes through this, 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 and then, and then points out to the, uh, and then points out the stitch on. Uh, Dawson's jacket, which his words only a surgeon knows uh, how to do. Let's see. I'll say again, just just another great reference to um, another great reference to Sherlock. I mean, yes, and his use of deductive reasoning. Yes, I I distinctly remember at one point watching the very first episode of Sherlock, um, the Benedict Cumberbatch TV series, folks. Um, I think just just being able to look at things at a glance and just go through every single minute detail like that. And my exact reaction was, it the what? <laughs> you see, that was my exact reaction after he had d done his ex explaining. And I thought, they, they made a great choice with the casting for Benedict Cumberbatch. Mm. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was Martin Freeman. Yes. It was Dr. Watson, yeah. But if you haven't if you haven't seen the Sherlock TV series, folks, I would 
I say it's one I'd highly recommend you watch. I say uh, over here in the UK, especially, it is on uh, Netflix right now. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, the um, the that uh, that uh, shooting uh, the VR into the wall that you mentioned uh, a few yes. minutes ago, yeah, that is a reference. Uh, that was uh, referenced thanks to uh, Basil um, shooting, shoot, shooting Miss, uh, shooting, shooting dog- stack of pillows. Yes, my good pillows. Like <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's the sort of guy who, um, oh, again, pillows. like Sherlock Holmes himself, he'll be you know polite and gentlemanly, but above all, all that matters to him is the work, is deducing who has done what by any means necessary. Indeed. And and if it means having to shoot a pillow in order to match a bullet, then so be it. Yeah. And he, we, he almost manages to match uh, the bullets, but then you get, but then you get to that like sharp, that sharp zoom in of like just that little section that doesn't quite match up. And he's just like, and then, Another dead end. Yes. Yeah. And he, he looks so um, downtrodden because of it, slumping over to the, the chair and saying, he was within my grasp. Yeah. But um, at, at, at this point in my, uh, in my obligatory, was like, was like, this has now become a running thing. This is becoming a, this is now a running thing on them. Um, uh, on these episodes, that I, that I have the uh, the the occasional reference to my fun notes, as you will, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 this is one of them. Um, he has uh, Basil ends up getting his violin. At this point, yes. I just I'm just like I, I put in my notes. Cue Mr. Krabs, and now allow me to play a song on the world's smallest violin. <laughs> Which uh, that, that that's probably the that's probably the best I'm gonna do as far as uh, uh, impersonating Mr. Krabs is uh, concerned. But uh, well, that was pretty good. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, joys of being a former acting student at college, folks. Uh, you you hear those voices often enough. You get to the you get to the point where you're actually able to more or less do them. Um, uh, perfectly. Yeah, although a great bit of um, advice I heard when it comes to. Um, impersonations. Mm-hmm. If you do a really bad impersonation of somebody famous, it's not a bad impersonation. It's a new character. Ah. And if you do a really good impersonation of somebody that nobody's ever heard of, it's a new character. I've never actually looked at it that way before. Hmm. Okay. I'll definitely keep that. I'll, an, def- I'll definitely keep that. In another mind. bit of sage acting wisdom from Jim Cummings. <laughs> oh god bless jim cummings let's say jim cummings would be very prominent during uh, the renaissance period mm. but, yeah i was like the, oh, yeah, the resume the... he's the resume he's got just from disney voice acting roles <laughs> alone pretty much speaks for itself i mean I mean, wh- I mean what i could do for a special episode i, I could just like dedicate an entire episode to go, I could dedicate entire episodes to going through these long-time Disney collaborators like Jim Cummings. Yeah, like a, a Disney Legends special. Yes! Yes! Yeah, that, that could work. That could work. But uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But for now, yes. I'm just, but for now, I'm just focusing on getting the films done first before I start yes. thinking about doing these other episodes to tie in to Disney somewhat. But nevertheless, um, uh, Olivia, tr- Olivia tries to explain to Basil that um, she's, uh, that her dad's been kidnapped, this, that, and the other. Um, and then Basil's just like, oh, look, see, I have no time to, I, ha- I have no time to, for, I have no time for lost fathers. And then, Olivia, wait, hold up a second. I didn't lose him. He was kidnapped by a bat and then light bulb moment. And then. My God, Batman has snapped. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Did he have a crippled wing? I don't know, but he had a pegged leg. Boom. 
and they and then that's when we hear uh, Fidget's name mentioned for the first time, and then he talks, and then he says, "The notorious Professor Ratigan." There is a minor continuity error here. I think just just minor at this point. Um, you see the um. When we see the f- uh, the picture frame of Ratigan for the first time, you can say, I say, just, just, just your suave smile, and then when we, and then we, see, then when we see the fire start to intensify, he ends up with a smile showing his teeth. I say, I say, I say, it's, it's just, it's just a minor continuity. Well, error. I don't know if it was a continuity error. I think it could have been deliberate, almost as if to say, you know, his. His presence is strong enough that it's almost as if he's actually there, mocking Basil. I suppose we, well, if that's the case, I, I suppose we could look at it that way, if that's the case. Yeah, it, it's entirely possible that it was yeah. a mistake, but even if it was, I think it's one that still works. Okay. Might. As the, um, the side Might. note um, to Fidget, he is, of course, the... Um, right-hand man to Professor Ratigan, but in the original books, uh, Ratigan had a different assistant, another mouse by the name of Captain Doran, who is, of course, a reference to Professor Moriarty's right-hand man, Colonel Sebastian Moran. Uh, In particular, from the Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Empty House. And yes, I do, I do have the, I do have like a, a separate page set up from the uh, Basil of Baker Street um, stories. I've got a page set up for, I've got a page up for that. I've got a page up for Basil, the great mass detective. Uh, So yeah, I'm, um, I'm pretty, pretty much sorted on that front as far as those little notes are uh, concerned. Yes. Uh, And you'll say just, just just the, um, just the, uh, the lightning strikes in them. in the background, and I, I actually, I actually found something out regarding those thunder, um, thunder and lightning sound effects. Uh, it's actually from so, those thunder and lightning sound effects come from something called Castle Thunders, and they've been used in numerous. I say, I say, I say this, this is like what this is like one of the first. Uh, I might be wrong. Um, uh, yes. Um, this was actually the last animated film that regularly used the uh, the Castle Thunder um, uh, sound effect. Huh. So yeah. Um, so so, so if, if, if you if you I'll say if you, if you actually go back to watch the uh, the older Disney films, folks, and and you and you pay close attention, especially to the uh, uh, the thunder sound effects. And you'll you'll notice that a lot of them sound practically the same, and that's all thanks to the fact that they're used from um, the Castle Thunder. Huh. I say, I say the um, I say the kind kind of like how whenever you're watching a Star Wars movie, you're always listening out for the Wilhelm scream. Ah, yes, because it first popped up in uh, Episode Four, and uh, and the Wilhelm scream. The Wilhelm scream's actually been used in uh, a couple a couple of Disney film couple of Disney films uh, during the Renaissance <laughs> period especially um yeah but see the Wilhelm scream it's it's probably one of the most used uh sound effects as far as the um the sound design of uh the films are concerned mm-hmm. ah! <laughs> the ah <laughs> actually i'm just gonna i'm just gonna play the original just so you guys know how, how it actually is supposed to sound i was like let's like, say we did our best we did our best there yes we did we can but try of course ah! yeah um basil going to into a bit more detail about how devious and evil ratigan is and then we get, and then we actually and get to um, one. One thing he says about him, um, he calls him the Napoleon of crime, which is yes. a, which is a direct quote from Sherlock Holmes describing his arch nemesis, Moriarty. Professor Moriarty. Yeah, uh, and it, it's such a good, such a good phrase, the Napoleon yeah. of crime. Yeah, the, I was like, 
it's so, so a case of from here on out, when, when you hear something like that, the Napoleon of whatever it is, that's when you know they mean business. Yes. Although that, that has now reminded me of um, a really, really bad joke from the latter half of the real Ghostbusters when they encounter the ghost of Professor Moriarty and he says, I am the Napoleon of crime. And Venkman says, and I'm the Caesar of salad. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, the real ghost. Oh yeah, that oh that's the animated Ghostbusters series, correct? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the one a, which start which started out so good and then went massively downhill. Yeah. But um let's say um uh, Mr. Flavisham is with uh Rattigan uh creating this uh what turns out to be a robotic um uh replica of Queen Mouse Toria, and I gotta say, Hiram Flavisham is a, a master of his craft. <laughs> yeah, you can tell he's done. You can tell he's been doing this for years. Yeah, but um, but of course, hearing Rattigan speak for the first time, this is where he's voiced by Vincent Price. Vincent Price actually said himself that this, out of all the films and roles that he has done, this was his personal favorite. Mm -hmm. And you can really see it in how pitch perfect his performance is. Like, you know, there are some um, celebrity actors you'll get in to voice a thing and they they always do a good job. But there are some of them where you can like, like, I don't generally have this problem, but there are some people who there's a bit of a disconnect. They can always just picture the actual actor in the booth. But across the board, everyone agrees that Vincent Price just is Professor Rattigan. Like, there's yeah. no point where you can see one end and the other begins. It's just a perfect blend of the actor and the character. Yeah. And then... Um, was there, um, was there, uh, in here, regarding how Rattigan was animated, folks, uh, it said, uh, during the recording of Vincent Price's lines, the animators sketched his exaggerated Shakespearean gestures and worked them into the animated poses of Rattigan. I love that when an animated film does that, when they add in, like, that. they do that all the time with uh, Mark Hamill when he's voicing the Joker. Ah, yes. I actually um, uh, saw some good quotes from uh, Barry Ingham and Vincent Price themselves about it. Um, mm -hmm. Barry Ingham was looking at a model of Basil and he said, as I look at the little model they made of Basil, I don't know whether I'm beginning to look like the model or he's beginning to look like me. <laughs> and, and, and then yeah. Vincent Price then Vincent Price said, when the actor gets there and the voice begins to happen, and in playing it you exaggerate it because it's an exaggerated character, you suddenly begin to see the character, the animation taking on your humanity, which is of course what they want, because the more human the mouse or the rat, it is better for the picture yeah and um yeah I, I, and, uh, and and you mentioned earlier regarding abbott and costello meet frankenstein uh yeah um yeah uh, although he was uncredited at the time people that knew he knew that people that knew they knew he was the voice of the invisible man mm -hmm. in regards to that one he, he, he first voiced the invisible man or rather played the invisible man in uh the sequel to the original Invisible Man, The Invisible Man Returns, which I think is honestly incredibly yes. underrated. It's a really, really good sequel, I find. It's yeah. It, it's it's a got a, the perfect balance of horror and comedy, I find. Um the very next one, The Invisible Woman, went too far in the comedy direction and it just became a farce. Yeah. Uh, the Invisible Man Returns, on the other hand is really really good <laughs> yeah uh okay so this one i've just found in uh, vincent price's uh, filmography folks for my for my fellow friends who are part of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints which i'm also part of there was a film called brigham young and vincent price played the role of uh, joseph smith interestingly uh what else has he done uh, okay, one of his most well-known roles uh, was of course the uh, the Ten Commandments film back in 1956 that uh, also had Charlton Heston as uh, Moses. 
uh, he was also in uh, uh, Price was also in House of Wax as Professor Henry uh, Jarrett. He was in the original Fly in 1958. Yes, Vincent Price is one of the greatest horror icons of all time. And yes. he, he has earned that. I actually recently watched a series of horror movies. He was in um, a series of adaptations of the works of Edgar Allan Poe by Roger Corman. Oh. Vincent Price was in most of them. And of course, he steals the show. He's, <laughs> he's another one of those actors where you put him in anything and he'll usually be the best and most memorable part. Everything else will be good, but there will be something yeah. about Vincent Price that just always grabs your attention and you just love him yeah and um and, and uh, f- for the music fans out there folks he was the narrator for michael jackson's thriller video how's about that mm-hmm. and uh one of his la- one of his last roles was uh, the inventor in the uh, Tim Burton classic, Edward Scissorhands. So, I mean, a career spanning nearly six decades and it pretty much speaks for itself. Oh yeah. But uh, I say, I say, uh, uh, apart, apart from the odd moment here and there where he does go like uh, over the top and say, finish it, Flavisham. Well, apart, I'll say, apart from like the odd moment here and there where he does something like that, he just comes across as such a suave character. Everything from, everything from how he presents himself, his attire, and just how, how he speaks to others as well. It is... Yeah. And you know and, that that yeah. that bit about him, you know, occasionally like letting the beast out, as it were. Mm-hmm. I I came across a brilliant quote by Vincent Price about Ratigan, which perfectly sums up why um, villains like Ratigan. There's just something about them that makes them the best. He said, "Ratigan is the ultimate villain. He's got a great sense of humor about himself, but dead seriousness at the same time about crime. He's a great actor." He's playing the great villain. Besides being a great villain, he is playing a great villain and adoring it, which all great villains should be like. This is his theory and mine too. (laughs) A A hero is a hero, isn't he? But a villain is always somebody that has to fool you all the time. He has many more facets to his character, many more sides to his humor. He has to be charming and witty and decadent and funny and everything going on at the same time. And he's much more fun to play. Yeah, it is. He, okay. And as as you know, I I love um, my villains. Villains are always my favorite part of yeah. movies. And Vince and Ratigan is one of my all time favorite villains. And that set, yeah. that statement by Vincent Price really sums up why. Like Vincent Price just got it. He understood exactly what he yeah. needed to bring to the role. Definitely. Uh, and, and, and like I just like I just said earlier, I say just from how just how he presents himself. I mean, you, you, it's easy to see why this is this is Vincent Price's favorite role out of everything that he's done over mm-hmm. the over the near six decades that he has that he was in the industry. His last role actually was actually a posthumous uh, release after he had uh, passed away a few months beforehand. Uh, the Thief and the Cobbler, that film was released uh, a few months after um, uh, Price had uh, passed away. But there's, there's no denying that the impact that Price had on uh, the industry from all the roles that he has done throughout his career, there's no denying that he made such a big impact on the industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and, oh, and I, um, yeah. when I was doing my research on uh, Ratigan, I found um, a very interesting bit of trivia about him. Uh, even though it's never said in the movie, in, mm-hmm. in the books, uh, his full name is Professor Chervil Ratigan. Though for some reason, there are some fan sites who say his name is Professor <laughs> Porrick Ratigan, and I've no idea why. Hmm. 
I I as I couldn't find any um official like statements that his name is is Porrick or whatever, but I don't know. Yeah. The um the, the, the um I said the final problem is uh, probably one of the most prominent exa- uh, prominent appearances of uh, Moriarty. Professor in- Moriarty. Yeah, yeah, it was um, the first appearance because Arthur Conan Doyle at that point was getting kind of fed up of writing Sherlock Holmes. So he's like, right, I now need to create the ultimate villain for Sherlock Holmes, somebody who can conceivably bring him down. And indeed, I think Professor Moriarty is basically the first ever super villain in a way, if you think about it. You know, somebody yeah. who is the ultimate bad guy for the hero. There were, of course, you know, like um, g- great bad guys in villain in uh, fiction before that. But mm-hmm. Moriarty in particular was the first of what we would define as the super villain in a way. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was one of the, yeah one of those supervillains where it doesn't matter how many times you foil uh, somebody foils his plans, he always comes back ready mm. to, ready to go again. I, say, I was, think my favorite Moriarty is probably uh, Jared Harris in the second Robert Downey Jr. movie. Uh, Book of Shadows. A uh, game of shadows. Game of shadows. I was like, uh, uh, I was like book of, book of shadows is a whole other thing which I could rant about, but I'll decide not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. So yeah. Um, and then we get to uh, the first of only like two or three songs throughout this uh, film. I say this. This is one of those rare instances where uh, we have a Disney film that isn't a musical. Hmm. But uh, but it still has songs here and there. Uh, yeah. But I see this is for its time one of the best. I say, I I can't actually recall previously if they actually did. Uh, like uh, like a villain song, if you will. So this this is probably one of the first ones that they actually did. You know, I think you might be right. The closest thing I can think of might be. Um... The elegant Captain Hook from Peter Pan, and maybe Trust in Me from the Jungle, Jungle Book. Book. Yeah, like th- those are the first ones that come instantly to mind. Anyway, yeah. I'll say, I'll say, I'll say. But wh- whether or not um, the world's greatest criminal mind is one of the first Disney villain songs, it is certainly one of the best. And again, it it sh- it shows just how much fun both Vincent Price has in the role and how much fun Professor Rattigan has in the role. Definitely. Like, the, uh, like I think that's the um, golden rule about if you are going to have a villain who is pure evil, make sure that they're having fun while doing it. Definitely. Um I say, I say there have been a lot of um, there have been a lot of villain songs um, throughout Disney's history, but but like Alan said, this is without a doubt one of the best ones for um, for its time. Uh, and then of and then of course we have and then of course uh, during the Renaissance period they would be like very I say they would have like at least a villain song in like every film that they did. Oh yeah, um, but. Yeah, was like, this is uh, again just the presentation presentation of it all. Um, was like, he, he, make, making references to some of the uh, the other um, the other crimes that he's been involved with: the Big Ben caper, the uh, the Tower uh, Bridge job, that cunning display that made London a sob. <laughs> Oh, just, and, and and I love and I love the look when 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 the henchmen um, then sing even meaner you mean it worse than the widows and orphans you drowned yeah which Jeez, I which, man which I actually which I actually uh, which I actually which I actually put into uh, my notes here whoa that song took a dark turn <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds so upbeat about it yeah and. And, and that and that's what gets this villain song to work in Rattigan's favor. Yeah, 
That is until one of his goons says, Ah, Bartholomew, yes. Yeah. Also voiced by Barry Ingham, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I shall double check the cast. Doesn't look like it's doesn't look like it's showing up on here at the moment, but um, I mean, it may, may very well he may very well be, but uh, he goes to rat again, the world's greatest rat, and then <laughs> spits his drink <laughs> so out. Uh, spits spits his drink out. The glass what breaks. Did you and he's call like, me? What? What did you call me? <laughs> and then and then they act. And then they actually make reference to the uh, the Eve Titus books here, that because despite the name, he is actually a mouse in the Basil of Baker Street books. Hmm. Yeah, I I think um, they might have made um, uh, the change here, maybe to like I don't know. D- in some way deepen the Ratigan character. It's like, is it to say he's been, he's a rat in a mouse's world, if you know what I mean. Ah. And, and, and that makes sense because um, supervising animator Glenn Keane said, when you discuss how these characters are going to relate, you're not talking about cartoons and funny ideas. These are real personalities. With Ratigan and the other characters, we developed what their history was. What was it like for them growing up as a kid? Why did he go bad? And why did Basil end up as such an extremely intelligent guy, but a social misfit? Hmm. I would, I I wonder if there's like, you know, a Great Mouse Detective Bible that Disney was working on when they made this movie. And if so, I'd love to read it. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, the, um, uh, Ratigan then ends up uh, just throwing Bartholomew out. I'm afraid you've gone and upset me. And then he gets you this. Know what happens when someone upsets me? And he gets this little bell out, which would be which uh, which will be very pivotal in the uh, the climax of the film, folks. So definitely stay tuned for that. So he just gives a little ring, and then you see Felicia come on screen. I mean, at this point, the music is very unsettling. Looks up to see the cats. Oh my! No, that's very unsettling. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I love, I love they do the thing of showing the demise of Bartholomew in shadow. I, yeah. I love, I love when a movie hints at something horrible like that. You just, you see the shadow of Felicia dangling Bartholomew into her mouth. Cut back to the goons not looking away in heart, and you just hear pleasant. <laughs> yes. And of course, um, Ratigan is so proud. Oh, Felicia, my precious, my baby. Did her, did Daddy's little honey bun enjoy her tasty treat? And then she burps. <laughs> and right I, in his face. Yeah. To to which to which I put in my notes. Uh, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. And then, and then. And, and then the thugs, and then the thugs uh, have have to like finish the song before. Yeah, I, and I love the way he eqs that. He goes back into the lair and says, "And now, as you were singing, and they're still a little bit shell shocked." <laughs> so he shows them the bell again, and they instantly go back into it. <laughs> yeah, so they, they give, and, I, they... and again, I love um, a moment like that with a villain when they're like, um, "Now." Uh, um, start singing my praises, and then they just have to do some little gesture just to say, I can kill you, you know, and then they jump right back into it. Definitely, yeah. It, <laughs> it, it's, and, and the fact that the camera zooms in at that point on, onto the bell, and you're just like, uh, okay, uh, guys, you might want to get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> but but, see, but see, they, they, they give him the works, they give him the, they give him the robe, they give him the crown, they give him the scepter, and it's just oh, absolutely glorious here. Mm-hmm. And then, and then yeah, that's get, that's the best word to describe it. It's glorious. Yeah, and then and then you just and then you get this great mirror cut with the uh, with the lightning uh, with the lightning. Um, was it his pose 
the same as the picture frame that we saw earlier. This is just a great mirror cut there. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> All right. I mean, th th there's so much we could praise Vincent Price on with this role. I mean, we could be here all day. We could. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, um, once, I'll say once, once that flamboyance is done, uh, <laughs> so we get, uh, we get fidget uh, outside, outside the, out, outside, uh, outside the window. And uh, Olivia just screams as soon as she sees him, fidget falls and, and then Basil just like gets himself ready. Boom, 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 boom. Let's go. And then, ah, ah, bother. He's escaped. But he did leave. He did leave their footprints to, so that we can see where he went. And <laughs> yeah, the um, and then bear, bear with me, folks. Um. Yeah, uh, they actually go in. They actually go somewhat into Sherlock Holmes' actual um, accommodation. They yes. actually go where, where we get a cameo appearance again in shadow by Sherlock Holmes himself with the voice of Basil Rathbone. Yeah, not um, not recorded for this because Basil Rathbone had passed on before this point, mm -hmm. but. They used a recording from the 1966 Cademan Records recording of the Sherlock Holmes story, The Red-Headed League. Yeah. And they they also, they do have um, a fresh actor though for uh, Dr. Watson, um, Basil Rathbone's normal uh, collaborator on Sherlock Holmes, Nigel Bruce had again passed on in 1953 before the recording. So he did not voice um, Dr. Watson in that particular recording. Yeah, but um, it, it is great that they actually got uh, Holmes and Watson in in shadow for, yes. uh, for this particular scene. And this is where we see, uh, this is where we see uh, Toby, who is, uh, who's uh, Holmes is uh, uh, in here somewhere? Uh, Basset Hound. So, yes, so yeah, um, Toby is Sherlock's pet. Yes, although um, according to my research in the actual books, uh, Toby isn't actually owned by Sherlock himself, but by a uh, bird stuffer named Mister Sherman, who sometimes lends um, lends Toby to Holmes whenever he needs. Um, and in the book, Toby is described as being a half spaniel, half lurcher. Ah, okay. So, so with with the hat that uh, Fidget ended up uh, leaving behind, Basil uses that to help Toby get the scent of uh, Fidget and. It's just the interaction between the two is just I just I just love the interaction between the two. Mm -hmm. And they they manage to let's see they manage to find the scent and they end up the uh the location of where Fidget is, he and uh, we end up at this toy shop. Uh, not not the same toy shop that we saw at the beginning, folks. This is, this is a no, much a, a larger human toy shop. Yes. And we see Fidget going through his uh, checklist, uh, tools, gears, girl, and uh, uniforms. And it's, it's he's, he's, he's almost done getting the, um, uh, the list done. Uh, he's, got, he's, got the, he's got everything apart from uh, Olivia. And then he hears, he hears Toby howling uh, outside the window. And he's just like, nope, I need to get out of here. And he ends up dropping the list. <sighs> and uh, so, uh, as far as the as far as the voice for um, uh, Toby is concerned, it's none other than OG Fred from Scooby Doo, Mister Frank Welker, who is mm -hmm. uh, now Frank's also a longtime Disney collaborator for doing like additional voices for yeah. 
uh, Disney like, projects, including pretty much whenever you need a, a voice for an animal, give it to Frank. He'll Definitely. knock it out of the park. Yeah. And the amazing thing in regards to Frank Welker is that he's still going to this day. Mm hmm. Now, I was like, I was like, this, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure this is the first time I've actually mentioned uh, Frank Welker uh, on here. I'm pretty sure it is. is uh, I mean, his voice over filmography, where do we even begin? He, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just going to try and rattle these off as quickly as possible. Uh, he did Cujo. Yes, the horror film Cujo based on the Stephen King book. Uh, he was uh, in Nausicaa of the... He was in the 2005 Disney dub, Disney English dub of uh, Nausicaa of, of the Valley of the Wind. Studio Ghibli fans uh, rejoice. Uh, he was in Gremlins. He was in the first troll film. Uh, he, was, uh, he, was the, he was the... He was the... He voiced the aliens in Flight of the Navigator. Uh, and yes, animal vocal effects for the 2003 Disney English dub for Castle in the Sky. So yeah, he's even been in Studio Ghibli films. Uh, ca <laughs> Castle, uh, Castle in the Sky. He was Igor in Pinocchio and the Emperor of the Night uh, with James Earl Jones as said emperor as well. Um, he was also uh, Totoro uh, in My Neighbor Ta Totoro and also Cat Bus! Uh, it's, it's just every time somebody brings up uh, my neighbor Totoro, I always have, end up having to just jump in and just go, Cat Bus! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he was, um, uh, he was uh, Louis the hot dog vendor in uh, Oliver and Company. He was in the Jetsons movie, Duck Tales, Tales from the Dark Side, uh, Marahute the Golden Eagle in The Rescuers Down Under. Uh, he was uh, the wolves. Was he he did the wolves in uh, Beauty and the Beast. He was Abu Raja and the Cape of Wonders uh, in uh, Aladdin. He was. He even did the mouse in the Lion King. Oh, goodness me! Wait, what? Oh, so like I like I said, my point being, he's done a lot of voiceover stuff. I could be here all day. I've just spotted he did Angel the Hawk. In the next Karate Kid, the one with Hilary Swank in it. Mm -hmm. Although probably one of his uh, best and best loved roles is another arch enemy. I'll get you next time, catch it next time. Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget! Dr. Claw himself. <laughs> oh my word, how's about that? <laughs> but I was like, at the, end, at the end of the day, as far as Frank Welker's voiceover stuff is concerned, just from the films alone. So, so yeah. Uh, so, so, Dude's so, got a great range. Yeah. So, Jim Cummings and Frank Welker. Two episodes for the Disney Legends uh, block. <laughs> oh, my word. I say, just wow. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, back here, we... We are, we're at this toy store. Uh, Fidget has dropped his list. And Basil sees the footprints. He sees the, um, he sees the uh, royal dolls stripped of their uniforms. Uh, the toys being stripped of their, uh, their gears. And, we, and then Olivia is somewhat uh, distracted when she, see, when she hears this... Um, um, like lullaby music. Lullaby music, yes. Uh, and then you, you actually see one of the toys, um, uh, one of the toys blowing bumble, blowing bubbles. That toy ends up being, uh, it turns out that toy is actually Dumbo. And it's it's not the first time, and I'm pretty sure it's not the first time Disney would have done this. Uh, ha having these little Easter eggs and making reference to like, previous uh, Disney films. I mean, Pixar are ever so famous for that. I mean, you can't go through a Pixar film without either a pick, a Peter Planet truck or a one one three. 
Oh, and jo- and John Ratzenberger for that matter. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't have a Pixar film without John Ratzenberger in some capacity. Yeah. Marvel movies need Stan Lee. Pixar movies need John Ratzenberger. Yeah. I say, it's just just a shame we're not going to have any more Stanley cameos now that Stanley's uh, yeah. gone. Well, say, people, the fans have actually petitioned for Deadpool to take over those cameos. Mm, I it it wouldn't be the same. I don't think that's a valid point. Yeah, but as I as I say, talking of Deadpool, I say, of of all the places for a Stanley cameo. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, of all the places for a Stanley cameo. Oh, I bet he had fun doing that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, oh boy, that that'll be fun to cover. Uh, some of <laughs> that'll be fun to cover the uh, the subsidiaries that uh, Disney have absorbed over the years, covering the Star Wars films, the Marvel films, the Fox films. I say that's gonna be that's gonna be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah. Um, uh, she ends up, fu- uh, Olivia ends up finding this cradle and uh, the cradle ends up having fidget in it. Just that gravelly laugh. Olivia screams and she's uh, thrown in the bag. And oh, all manner of chaos throughout this, uh, uh, throughout the next couple of minutes or so. Where um, you've got, you've got this uh, mechanic, you've got this wind up uh, jousting night which I would assume would be a reference to Sword and Stone in some capacity with the, with the jousting tournament towards the end of the film. Possibly. Um, uh, Basil manages to jump and catch uh, onto something above him. Uh, Dawson ducks, but ends up being caught by the, uh, uh, by the joust and then ends up uh, stuck on like this like, sort of like dot, uh, dartboard right on the bullseye. <laughs> and, and then... Basil turns his head round, boom, symbols onto his face. <gasps> and so he manages, manages to come back round, falls to the ground, ends up uh, scattering what, what looks like marbles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then as they, a, n- a number of them end up hitting the board and then boom, one in the face of Dawson. And I thought, well, that's the bullseye. Hey. Yeah, and and yes, the uh, the game sh- uh, yes the game show bullseye was on at round about the same time. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but talking talking of uh, marbles going a bit off uh, uh, tangent for uh, again, I was like, I was like th- this is another thing that happens with these episodes. We do sometimes go off on these uh, tangents before going back onto like the main topic. But in regards to the mar in regards to the marbles, uh, th- th- there's a YouTube channel that I've been watching for like. Uh, f- a few years now, a uh, uh, Yelly's Marble Runs. That ring any bells, Alan? No. no. Well, uh, you see, he he actually does these. Um, he's, let's let's just say it's uh, marble sports competitions. Cool. Yeah, yeah. He, I see. He's he's got he's got the actual like marble run uh, toys that we uh, that we used to have as kids. I see, I see, he uses those. He uses those among other things, uh, marbles, I think marble sand rally, uh, marble league used to be called the Marble Olympics, but uh, had to be called <laughs> the Marble League because uh, the IOC very protective regarding Olympic copyright. Um, yeah. And uh, for the Formula One fans out there, he even had Marbula One, a nice little <laughs> nice little play on words there. And he act- and he actually spoke to uh, the Formula One management team. And uh, they gave him permission to be able to use the Formula One name in some capacity. And, uh, and the, the great thing is having these marble sports competitions to keep people like me entertained when there was no sports action going on during the early stages of uh, lockdown around about this time last year. It's, it is without a doubt one of the best channels on YouTube that I've ever come across. And um, I say, I say, I say some, of the, some of the names for the teams for the Marble League as well. You've got like, uh, you've got like the Jungle Jumpers, the Green Ducks, the, uh, and, and of course, uh, for, for long time uh, Marble League fans will know exactly the, uh, the, the rivalry between the O-Rangers 
and the uh, and the marbles are all orange, and the savage speeders. I was like, I was like. It's just let's see, with the old rangers especially. Let's see, it's just every let's see, they've they've actually they've just got a simple chant for, for the team. And it just goes a little something like this. <clears throat> it just goes, oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's say, let's go, Rangers. <laughs> really internet simplicity. Yeah. And let's see. Let's say I actually came across the channel just by accident, and I've been I've been hooked on it ever since. <laughs> say, like I say, it is one of the best channels I have ever uh, come across, without a doubt. I'll uh, check it out. Yeah, let's say they've actually got the uh, 2021 Marble League coming up uh, during the summer. Uh, yeah. he, he's pr- he's probably in the process of just getting getting it all uh, recorded. Uh, at the moment, so getting it recorded, getting it edited, get, get all the uh, the team chants in, uh, the graphics, this, that, and the other. So yeah, but but the production value for what he has is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, uh, but the end of the chase here, the end of the chase here, you've got uh, Basil on what looks like it's like um, uh, one of those pull string dolls. Yeah. Uh, was it, was it at the end of the chase where he's uh, bouncing on something? I think I'm trying to remember what it is. It's, it, uh, it's the string of um, one of those uh, pull string dolls where you pull it and, and it goes, Mama. Oh, oh, no, Mama. That, that, that's what that's once the chase is finished. Uh, it's, it's when he's trying. Oh, to... right, right. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I was say, I say, it's, uh, it looks like it's like a, 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 a bouncing horse or something along those lines. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the, on a the spring. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll call it a spring horse. I'll just make it easier for me. Yeah. Um, he's on a spring horse. He's he almost catches fidget, gets the top of this huge pile of toys from like building blocks to dolls, and uh, and fidget decides, you know, bye bye, and just knocks the whole thing down, and <laughs> and that's and that's when Basil gets caught on the drawstring doll, right, and and you, and you just hear fidget just celebrating the fact that he uh, he's got everything and uh, yeah it's um hmm. not looking good yeah because to um uh, uh, but uh, be- before before we uh, go back to fidget um the uh, they both both basil and dawson do take some sort of responsibility dawson more than basil uh, that they should they should have paid more attention uh, in regards to making sure Olivia was okay, and then Dawson finds the finds this checklist that Fidget left behind, and then and then Basil he's just like Dawson, you've done it. This list is precisely what we need. Quickly back to Baker Street, and. Then we get back. Then we get back to Fidget. He shows everything that um, he managed to get to uh, uh, to Rattigan, and then he's gonna let everything on the list. Uh-oh. What's uh, wrong? Yeah, where's the list? And I love when he goes, "What? I was in the time door. Then they had a a woo, a woo. You're, You're not, not coming, coming through." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then, and then when he mentions Basil, he's like, "What? Basil on the case? case? Why are you gibbering, little?" <laughs> I love how he, he looks like he's about to burst, but then he just, yeah, just calm, calm. And this yeah. is, my dear fidget, you've been hanging upside down too long. Yeah. Then, like, walks away with him, all friendly, and then they go around the corner, and you just hear, you just hear the bell ring. And then yeah. Felicia comes into play. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! And of course, like Felicia's trying to eat fidgets, and Ratkin's just like just on the ground, going, "Oh dear, that idiot Basil poke his stupid nose into my wonderful scheme and foul up everything." <laughs> oh dear! J- just another testament to how great Vincent Price is as Ratkin. Yeah, like every line he delivers, pitch perfectly. Yeah. 
Poor Basil. Oh, he's in for a little surprise. Yes, he gets a sinister idea. Yes, as most great villains do. Oh, yes. A wonderful, awful idea. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Basil and Dawson examine the um, uh, the checklist, even to the most minute detail of the paper that is used. Which I be- for the paper I believe is from like Mongolia, something along those lines. I think that's right. Yeah, um, and, then, and then Basil does this like, like chemical reaction, and then they get the and then they manage to work out uh, the destination, uh, the next destination for them to head to. They head to this, um, they head to this tavern, which is on the Thames Riverfront. Uh, dressed up as uh, a crewmate of a ship, interestingly. Now, no, I say it's it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting disguise to help them try and somewhat blend in. Although he did, although Basil could have got a bigger shirt for Dawson, though. Yeah, <laughs> Cause, cause I guess he, he just <laughs> um, picked out stuff from. Uh, his own cupboard of disguises and thought, well, this will just have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the, and the whole, and the whole, di- and the whole disguises thing. Yeah. Um, Yet another thing that um, Sherlock Holmes had a penchant for. Yeah. M- maybe, I think m- maybe that was part of the inspiration uh, for the, uh, for the Hitman games, potentially. Maybe. I'd, I'd need to um, look sub, into that. Sub, subdu- subduing the enemies and taking uh, uh, t- taking their um, taking their clothes and make uh, as and then disguising yourself as be it uh, be it a bodyguard. And I'm going by the uh, the, the Hitman reboot trilogy. Right. Uh, I, I I don't know if that would necessarily have been directly inspired by Sherlock Holmes in particular. Maybe just you know just the concept in general of yeah. blending in with the enemy. Yeah. I was like, I was like disguises from like a, a housekeeper, a bodyguard, a waiter, uh, the, the, I think among many others. But um, they, they're actually at this, uh, at this uh, cabaret-esque variety show. Uh, and you, are we only... We only see like two or three acts here. The, the first one is this octopus uh, just juggling with this with this jolly ragtime music in the background, <laughs> and um, and then what? And then once the octopus's act is uh, finished, it's, Dawson, it's booed off. Dawson's the only one that applauds him, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't go down well, and then. Then the next, um, what is it? The the next uh, the next act is you've got a, uh, what appears to be a, a frog. I think it is. You've got you've got two you've got two of these animals on a uh, on a unicycle, <laughs> and immediately they get booed off. <laughs> <laughs> But my word, uh, and then, and then you just hear this. Uh, then you just hear this whimsical music, and you get this. Then you get this mouse on stage, uh, voiced by Melissa Manchester, who does this song, uh, "Let Me Be Good to You." And, and I believe she actually wrote the song herself. She did. Yes, uh, that is that is mentioned in the uh, the closing credits of the film that Melissa Manchester did write this song. Hmm. Um, and then, but so like, so about, so about the midway point, she has like a, a costume change, and then it gets it, and then she's wearing this sort of like this tight leotard. Then I just thought, okay, Jessica Rabbit, eat your heart out. Oh wait, hang on a second. Uh, I'm a, uh, I'm about a couple of years early for that one. Yes, yes, yes. Because, <laughs> but you, you know what I mean, folks. I mean, I was like, the reason, the reason I bring up the uh, the whole uh, couple of years early thing is because this one was released in 1986. Who Framed Roger Rabbit? 1988. Also mm-hmm. done by Disney. Well, technically Touchstone Pictures, which is a subsidiary of uh, of Disney. Yeah, but Disney still had some hand in it. Yes. Because it wasn't just Disney characters that were in this film. You also had Warner Brothers characters as well. But... <laughs> 
there's an idea for a spe- there's an idea for another um, special episode for King of Isolation Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, because because there's there's like one or two scenes in particular that are just iconic from oh that. yes yeah uh you because you've got that piano battle between Donald and Daffy <laughs> and then and then you've and then you've got and then you've got for the first time on screen together Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny I mean. That is just effectively the dream for a lot for a lot of kids that watch this film. PG rating aside, folks. Uh, yes, but uh, nothing. Just just being able to see all those um, all those characters. Mm-hmm. There's always something just so satisfying about a good crossover like that. Yeah, and uh, but yeah. Uh, so once once that song's finished. Um, and once we're all suitably hot under the collar. Yep. <laughs> Mind out the gutter, boys. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Uh, Basil and Dawson, they... Um, they spot they, Fidget. They spot Fidget, and then they, they, they manage to get to uh, Rattigan's hideout. And then they see the bottle that, uh, that Olivia's trapped in, or... At least they think it's Olivia trapped in that bottle. And then it turns out it's Fidget wearing uh, Olivia's clothing. Well, uh, Olivia's hat and jacket specifically. Yeah. And then you get this huge surprise party entrance from Rattigan that, yeah, he's... But uh, the only problem there is that uh, Rattigan says that uh, you're about 15 minutes late. Now, Trouble with the chemistry set, old boy. Now, I don't think Rattigan, I don't think a villain would be overly concerned about timekeeping, especially when it comes to... Well, when you have someone who is as meticulous as these Professor Moriarty types, like, they, and this is a moment where he probably has been planning this moment for years, a moment where his arch enemy would finally be in his grasp. He would probably want everything to be perfect. Yeah. And, And he says as much when in the next moment where he says, you don't know what a delightful dilemma it was trying to think of the most appropriate method for your demise. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, but... Um, it kind of got um, a Batman and Joker thing going on there. You know, yeah. each bad guy wanting to make sure that their enemy's death is just right. <laughs> yep, indeed. The um, but uh, he manages. But Vatican, of course, being the genius that he is, the Napoleon of crime, as Basil put it earlier. Uh, Vatican being the Napoleon of crime, he's able to see through the disguises that um, Basil and Dawson had. And then, yeah, uh, I mentioned Rube. I mentioned Rube Goldberg earlier, folks. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> That mousetrap contraption, that has Rube Goldberg written all over it. Oh, Every, yeah. Everything from the record player to the... Uh, to the marble. The, cross, to... the crossbow, the axe, and then you've got the big anvil above them. And, and I love the way um, Rattigan then finishes up when he says, snap, boom, twang, thunk. Splat. Splat! And so ends the short, undistinguished career of Basil of Baker Street. <laughs> and I especially love when he, he reveals the plan and, and Dawson says, you despicable. And Rat goes, yes. <laughs> so he relishes in being despicable. Yes, exactly. And again, that's the thing when you are going to make a, a bad guy who is pure evil and they know it, make absolutely sure that they're having the time of their lives doing it yes definitely. like 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 your palpatines like villains who just <laughs> who just have have a ball absolutely just no regard for anyone's well-being but their own but they still relish in it regardless exactly but, yeah 
I say, but, but of course, a villain being a villain, they I say, villain cliche number one, folks. Uh, they say, they just, they, yes, they just, they just monologue, which the Incredibles do poke a lot of fun at. Yeah. Well, and, and again, like with a, um, a character like Radigan, again, like they're proud of the work and the planning they've put into this. And so they want to show off. They need somebody to show off too. And that's one of yeah. the reasons why they need somebody like um, a Basil or a Sherlock Holmes or a Batman in their life. Somebody who can in some way appreciate their genius. Yeah, absolutely. And um, let's say, uh, I'll say the record player is the start of this Rube Goldberg um, contraption, uh, and it's and it's a song that uh, it's a song that Rattigan wrote himself. Goodbye, a sprightly so tune I recorded specially for you. <laughs> yeah, you'll say goodbye so soon. That's the name of the song, and it, yes, it is Vincent Price that's actually doing the singing here. So <laughs> hats off to him for that one. <laughs> yeah, um, not, you get. One, but not one, but technically two villain songs in this. For the same, yeah, exactly, yeah, for the same, for the same villain though. There's, yeah, and they're both so good. Yeah, absolutely. But 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 I th- but I think out of the two, the world's greatest criminal mind is probably the one that stands out. Oh yeah, oh oh definitely. But goodbye so soon is still a really good song. Definitely. Um, and you've got Basil just sitting there. You've got Basil lying in that mousetrap. He's he's effectively given up at this point. The queen's in da- the queen's in danger, and the empire is doomed. And then Dawson realizes it's the queen's diamond jubilee. So, so then we so then we cut to Buckingham Palace with rule Britannia in all its pomp and circumstance as well. And to that. We salute you for your music choice. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, uh, Queen Mouse Toria, uh, voiced by Eve Brenner. Uh, she, uh, unaware of what's going on outside, the um, uh, Ratigan's henchmen decide to take over as the guards. They knock on the door and they give and they give her they give her this huge, oversized uh, present. Uh, is it to to our beloved queen? As I can't remember how the rest of it. Uh, to our beloved queen, as her sixty-year year reign, reign comes to comes an, to an end. Yeah, and then and then the present is unwrapped, and that's that's the uh, robotic replica of uh, Queen Victoria, uh, Mouse Toria. Mm! Mouse Toria, <laughs> it's mice. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> And and you've got Rattigan doing the uh, the voiceover work uh, behind the ca- um, uh, behind the curtain, Voice it, voicing the um, robot Mouse Toria. Yeah, uh, and you've and it's and it's Flavisham that's uh, doing all the uh, uh, the controlling, the operating. Yes, yeah. the operating. Yeah, um, and then. And and then, and then the scripts that, and then the script that Flavisham has to adhere to, uh, Rattigan ends up being the con- ends up being appointed uh, appointed I say that in air quotes as yes. the as the royal consort to um, Mouse Toria and just the gasp and one of the kids with a raspberry blow as well, just like, <laughs> it's just brilliant, um, and then. And then we cut back to Dawson and Basil. And Dawson's just like, right, okay, right, right. If you've just given up at this point, why don't we just set the trap off now and be done with it? And then, and then maniacal, maniacal look on his, maniacal expression aside, folks. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it is, it's like I said, it is pretty maniacal. <laughs> but yeah. As, as if he's just completely lost it. I mean, well, they do say that there is a thin line between genius and madness. Yes, a very fine line, and it's difficult to and uh, and and of course, uh, and of course, it's sometimes difficult. A lot of the time, it is very difficult to tell tell the difference between the two. But, yes, but there are characters like Basil who you think might have a toe in both. Yeah, but uh, but even at that, we. Um, 
Oh boy. Uh, I think he's quick. I like the quick, um, uh, the quick deduction skills that you mentioned earlier. But he's just like uh, working out all the uh, the equations, this, that, and the other. Uh, and then, and then it's just the timing. Uh, gets the uh, activates the uh, the mouse trap, which which ends up act, which ends up uh, continuing the uh, Rube Goldberg uh, chain reaction. All while Olivia is trying to push the cork out of the bottle so she can escape. But um, but, uh, but it ends up, uh, but the, but the cork ends up popping out after the uh, after the anvil drops on the mouse trap. That very conveniently just splits the mouse trap into freeing Dawson and Basil in the process, and then and then Basil's the only one that's smiling for the camera, which Ratigan also pointed out. <laughs> you now will you remember, won't to... remember to smile for the camera, <laughs> won't you? Say cheese. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But even at that, even at that, it is just. Um, they they manage to get to uh, Buckingham Palace while Fidget is on the verge of uh, feeding Mouse Toria to uh, Felicia. They they get they get there just in time. They get Mouse Toria off uh, Fidget, and uh, Fidget almost falls into Felicia's mouth again, <laughs> and. This is, this is just the um, the angry look on Toby's face when he manages to uh, reunite with Basil Dawson and uh, Olivia. His one of his ears makes a staircase. <laughs> I, was like, I, was like, I, 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 I do love cartoon cartoon anatomy like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like just absolutely. I mean, who who doesn't at this point? But yeah. um, I was like, they, uh, they they get to they get to Buckingham Palace they get to Bucking, Buckingham Palace, um, and then Toby ends up chasing Felicia uh, th- th- uh, down down the Buckingham Palace streets. Um, Felicia manages to escape, or so she thinks, because <laughs> she's just very smug. Just like nah, 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 nah. you, you need to got me. They say so just like flicks the tail up and then jumps over the wall and then ends up <laughs> royal guard dogs. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, just it's just just another classic comedy guy. Uh, the one uh, of the one of the evil. Uh, one of the evil side characters, like, yes, I escaped, and then it turns out they haven't escaped, and they yeah. get they get <laughs> they get some sort of comeuppance, if you will. Yes, exactly. And then we get to we get to a fantastic uh, climax, split into like two or three parts. The first part mm-hmm. is where you've got this huge. Um, Airship esque um, contraption that uh, Ratigan's got, and you've got Fidget doing uh, the pro- the pedaling to get the propeller to work. <laughs> uh, but, and and then and then Basil gets th- and then Basil gets the idea of using the um, uh, he, he gets the idea of using the Union Jack. And the balloons that are outside Buckingham Palace as their as their uh, makeshift uh, hot hot air balloon, if you will, basically. Yeah. And and then and then we, we and then and then we embark on this chase sequence of um, Basil trying to catch up with uh, Ratigan going through going through the. Uh, the London night sky while Basil's theme is playing in the background. And, and it's, and it's, it's somewhat quicker than when we actually hear it uh, over the opening credits, which yeah, it's much which, more action paced. Yes. Now, yes, that, now, yes, I know you guys are probably going to be thinking, are you just going to get pushed there because they recycle the sense? Yeah. This is one of the occasions where it works in the film's favor. Yes. Yeah, but um, yeah, <laughs> but like, 
Let's say, let's say just the, the quicker uh, the quicker tempo of uh, Basil's theme at this point works in the film's favor, adding to the thrill of the chase. Exactly. And uh, and then and then we get and then we get another piece of comedy gold here. Uh, Fidget saying he needs to lighten the load. Where he's, oh, you want to lighten the load? Excellent idea. And then he and then Vatican just tosses Fidget overboard. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and of course, because of Fidget's crippled wing, he can't fly properly. So it's, he, he tries to keep afloat and then he just goes, Wee! Splosh. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and given roundabout, given the location they they're at, they're at uh, at this point, uh, yeah, they're they're definitely somewhere like over like uh, part of over part of the River Thames. Yes, it, though I, I did read that there was um, a novelization of the movie, which which clarified that he did in fact survive the fall. There you go, folks. So fidget is uh, fidget's okay. He, he 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 lives to kidnap another day. Yes, but um, and then Basil manages to get onto uh, Rattigan's airship, and then Rattigan, uh, and while this happened, it was a Rattigan. Was, he goes even faster than Fidget had done previously, uh, unaware of the fact that uh, they are hurtling towards Big Ben. And it's not until Olivia screams that it catches Vatican's attention and he's like, ah! And then boom, and you just hear the glass shatter on one of the faces. And this is what this is one of this is one of the uh, first uh, first uses of computer animation, essentially. Yeah, one of the first uses of computer animation through um Throughout, um, uh, was it uh, throughout Disney's history? But I see, there, there was some computer animation in the Black Cauldron. Yes, but but this is like the first prominent That's, use. Yeah, but uh, but, I say, but the the way it's animated, you you wouldn't think it. You wouldn't think it was uh, computer animation. Because it still no. looks, because it still looks hand drawn. Yeah. But uh, yeah. And then, and then we get to the second part of this uh, climax. And you've got, you've got Rattigan approaching Basil, knocks him off one of the gears. Olivia bites um, Rattigan's hand. Basil gets back up. And then the cape that Rattigan had on, Basil manages to get, uh, get that caught in the one, uh, a set of gears. And then Rattigan decides, pro probably just like an uh, instinctive reaction. He ends up, um, he, he ends up uh, kicking Olivia into another set of gears below Blown. And uh, yeah, effectively, with where Olivia is positioned, it looks like she's going to get crushed. But uh, Basil gets the idea of uh, activating this um, this lever to start the start the chain to to start like shooting up towards where Olivia is, and and he manages to get he manages to get her safe and sound, and then we get to <laughs> yeah, I say. Like, I mean, I, th I, th I think the second part of this climax is probably sort of like somewhat of an interlude between between the air chase and the actual climax of the film. Yeah, so, kind of. Yeah, but um, I think the music just goes full. Well, somewhat full. I think it goes into like the music. The score at this point it goes into it goes into horror territory, and uh, yeah, and, Rat uh, Ratigan starts to unleash the beast, as it were. Like he I mentioned earlier, that completely I think, like, unhinged. 
like before he's been all um, poised and elegant and calm and collected, but there's always been a sense that there's something within him that is ready to snap at any moment and just go ape shape and, you know, yes. snarling and monstrous. Yeah. Uh, uh, like I said, he just goes, he, he snaps, rips the cape off and just completely unhinged. And it's at this point where you just like, yeah, you can, you can see the fur on his back at this point. Yeah. And you just and hear he, it. And as he crawls up the gears, you can see the rat within him. Yeah. Like, you, you just hear him grunting as he's making his way towards Basil. Just, it's almost like a, a, a werewolf transformation. Yeah. Again, again, tying into the many horror roles that Vince that Vincent has done over the years, mm -hmm. and um, see, see, during that particular part there, where, where you've got um, where you've got Rattigan like going up the gears, and then let's see, there's a couple of quick there was a couple of quick cuts here uh, here and there during this part here, where you've got uh, uh, you've got Basil and Olivia, they they get they get to the edge, and then it's just like, like a, it's like quick pan, and then I was like quick pan, and then just looking down, and you're just like you're just like yeah, from a mouse's point of view, that's a long way down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> but um, I say, and, and and then of course, as with most, uh, uh, of course, as with most climaxes uh, at this point in. Um, Especially during this part of uh, Disney's um, uh, Dis era, th th this this particular era of Disney films, uh, it wouldn't be a climb. It wouldn't be a great climax to a Disney film with without having without without it being at night, and you've got the rain starting to fall. Yeah, I say, I say, it's so, so like so like one of those things. It's one of those things that uh, Disney would uh, again do during the uh, during the Renaissance period, uh, where where the battle either takes place at night, it has rain, or a combination of both. Yeah, but but, uh, but of course, with with the lightning that's uh, with the thunder and lightning that's happening in the background throughout the film, um, it actually it actually works. So this is a case of it working in the film's favor again. Yes. It's abs. It's it's it? for as short as this part of the uh, climax is. It is still very intense from the visual presentation to the music, and then just actually seeing what is happening on screen. Olivia manages to get onto uh, Basil's uh, um... Basil's balloon. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the balloon, uh, Basil's balloon contraption, um, yes. but um, at the expense of uh, Rattigan just jumping onto Basil, and then and then they're just falling down the side of Big Ben. You, you can actually see Basil just trying to grip on, but it's not going to work in those slippery conditions. And mm -hmm. they end up on the hands of Big Ben itself. Dawson calls out. I think it's Dawson. Calls out to Basil, telling yes. Telling him where they are, yes. and then and then just Rattigan just comes out out of nowhere, boom, and then just starts pummeling him and, yeah. and scratching at him with these horrifying claws that have grown. Yeah, it. I say, I say, it's. I say, it's the nightmare fuel here at this point. It's not as intense as the uh, climax of the Black Cauldron, but it's still. No. It is still terrifying to some extent. Yes, but not too much. Yeah, but uh, but um, let's see, let's see, so what are, what are the last scratch? What are the last um, clawings that Rattigan pulls on Basil is like right on his back, and you just you just hear you just hear Basil uh, uh, grunt at that point, just like oh, grunt, grunting in pain. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in his position at this point. And then as he. You see Basil looking up at the. You can, you can see Basil looking up at the clock. It's almost a, It's almost ten o'clock. Light, lightning strike, and then, and then you just, and then you just actually see Rattigan just like towering over him, and with one last swipe of the claw, 
Boom. Knocks him off. Dawson and Flavisham don't quite catch Basil's um, hands. And then, oh, oh boy. The villain gloating about the fact that they've won. But oh, I won. <laughs> on the contrary, the game's not over yet. The game's not over yet. I have to wonder how Basil managed to get that bell, though. I have to wonder yeah. how he managed that, though. There maybe because um, uh, there was a bit where um, when they're first falling onto the hands, Ratigan then grabs a hold of Basil. Maybe in in that moment. Possibly. Um, I was like, I was, I was like, would we call that a minor plot? I was like, in my eyes, would I call that a minor plot hole? Not really. No. Nah. But, um, <laughs> but, but he, it's, just, it's just the look on Rattigan's face. He's just, you're just like, oh, wait, wait, what? Where, wait, where's the bell? And then, and, uh, and uh, I see just, Dum. yeah, the iconic chimes of Big Ben when the clock strikes 10 and you just see the camera shaking. Rattigan falls off, grabs hold of Basil and then they both fall presumably to their death. Rattigan does, yes. But Basil, that, that, um, that pedal propeller, that's what he managed to use to save himself after, after Olivia thinks, oh no, he's, he's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I mentioned it in the last episode, uh, Black Colton, yes. where you've, where you've got one of the um, one of the good guys, uh, uh, supposedly dead, but turns out to be okay. This is the first time that we actually see the protagonist in well, what well in this era, especially the first time in this era that we see the the protagonist of the film in that position, mm-hmm. where you think they're where you think yep they're dead, but uh, turns out. Uh, they're okay. Let's say uh, protagonists that have been in that position previously. We had Snow White, uh, Pinocchio, and I think that's about it until Basil came along. I might be wrong on that one, folks. Uh, might need to might might need to delve a little deeper into the um, into the archives regarding that one. But um, but all hunky dory, and the and and Basil is thanked by the queen and and we, and we actually see that the newspaper uh, the date june 21st this takes place over the course of like three nights <laughs> but 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 with but the thing is with the way it's edited it's as if it's done over the course of the whole that whole just that one evening yeah but uh, but I but I, I did uh, I did a bit of research as to like um, the time span this film takes place over. I think it starts on it starts on June nineteenth, June twentieth being the Diamond Jubilee itself, and then that newspaper yeah. the front of the paper yes. June twenty first. Because uh, um, in the first scene when we see a Ratigan in his lair, he pulls out the newspaper and says, "Tomorrow evening, our beloved monarch celebrates her Diamond Jubilee." There you go. Oh, so, but, of course, but of course, me watching it when I was younger, it, to, I, say, I, I, didn't re- I didn't really pick up on those m- smaller details. I, I just assumed yeah, it just like... took place over the course of the, that whole evening. But, um, but, 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 but watching it now, it's, it's easy to see. It's, it, it's a bit, it's more easy. It's much easier to pick up on those um, Smaller things. Yeah. And um, as Henry Manstein said, the pacing zips along. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. Um, uh, Olivia and uh, uh, Hiram, they, they thank, well, we'll say, well, uh, uh, Olivia thanks um, Basil and Dawson. Um, and they, um, because, uh, because Hiram looks at his, cl- looks at his watch and he's like, oh my, we're, 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 we're late for our train. Train back to Scotland, I would assume. I, say, like, mm-hmm. I, I would assume the train would be to Edinburgh. I might be wrong on that one, but... Um, yeah, probably. Yeah. Because so, again, judging by the dialect of um, uh, the Scottish accents, I would assume probably somewhere around about Edinburgh region, possibly. But, yeah, um, probably. 
Yeah, but see, uh, one running gag I did, one gag, one running gag I didn't actually bring up until now is the fact that you've got Basil not being able to pronounce uh, the the Flavish name uh, yeah. correctly, or, or rather, not not caring enough to pronounce it properly because whenever she says um, Miss Flamhammer and she says Flavisham, he whatever. <laughs> yeah, and, and and it's actually Dorse as a, and when. And when Basil says Miss Flanger Hanger, it's <laughs> Dawson. It's Dawson. It's just like, oh, whatever. Um, and then, uh, it, and then Dawson is on the verge of leaving to look for accommodation, and then, and then, we, and then we have this, uh, and, and then we have this lady mouse come in at the uh, at the end, um, wondering. Where where Basil is, and then Daw- it's it's Dawson that answers the door, and then it's at this point that Basil introduces um, the young lady. This to... is my good friend, Doctor Dawson, with whom I do all my cases. Yes, effectively making Dawson his partner is uh, his partner in regards to solving these um, these cases. Mm-hmm. And. And, and and just and just the little um and, and just a little um monologue at the end from from Dawson. Uh from that day on, Basil and I were a close team, solving many cases together over the years, but always looking back on on that first case with a lot of fondness as his introduction to Basil of Baker Street, the great mouse detective. And uh <laughs> and uh, of course Cinema Sims fans will um will know where I'm going with this one. And roll credits and that's when the credits start you hear basil's theme and then you have and then you hear goodbye so soon at the end as well this is one of the, this is one of those rare cases of actually having a relatively short um credits mm. but uh yeah that so there we go that is um that is it basil of baker street done in uh around right about two hours I may need to split this into two parts, folks. <laughs> I, I, I might. Or, or, or um, snip out some of the tangents. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably keep, maybe keep the tangents, maybe keep the tangents for a separate video. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. But, uh, Hashtag release the tangent cut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so... Overall, like like I said, a fanta- a great return to form for um, mm-hmm. uh, for Disney after the uh, the poor performance of the uh, the Black Cauldron. Yeah, one of my favorite Disney films. Yeah, I say I say I say same here because it's it's one of those it's one of the uh, it's one of those films from this particular era that I remember watching a lot when I was younger. Uh, Basil, mm-hmm. uh, Black Cauldron, Oliver and Company. Yep. Was it, was it, those, those three especially. Back when we used to watch Disney movies on this strange thing called a videotape. Yeah, VHS is. <laughs> yeah, it's um. Let's see, it's it's. Let's see, this is definitely up there as one of the um. It's definitely up there as uh, another fantastic film. It's um. Absolutely. I say, and 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 in a way, uh, in a way, uh, for kids especially, a great way to get them introduced into the. Sherlock Holmes uh, formula. Yes. Be- before before in before getting them into the uh the actual Sherlock Holmes um uh cases themselves. Yes. So yeah, anyway, on to the scores now. So honestly, couldn't I say couldn't fault the story or the characters, so they both get a 10 right no. out of the gate. Could no, the, not they- fault them at all. The characters are all superb in one way or another. Yeah, because like, like, even the side characters, they have yeah, they have their moments as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, um, let's see the visuals. I I loved um, even like a little moment with um, uh, 
the goons earlier in, in Vatican's lair where Bartholomew first calls him a rat and they say, <laughs> oh, he, he didn't mean a professor. It was just a slip of the tongue. And then Radigan says, I am not a rat. And the two and two others says, yeah, that's, of course you're not. You're a mouse. Yeah, that, that's right. A mouse. Yeah, a, a, a big mouse. Silence. <laughs> Uh, a very funny cameo by Bill from Alice in Wonderland. Yes, yes, yes. But the um, the the, um, the thing the thing here is, uh, when you watch these films often enough, be it going through like various scenes just with the dialogue, or in some cases, listening to listening to the uh, the songs or the score from from the film, you get to a point where you've listened, where you've watched the film often enough, and you're listening to the soundtrack on, say, Spotify, for instance, mm-hmm. uh, Spotify or Amazon Music or wherever you like to listen to your music. The, you, you get to the point where you're at, uh, where in the case of um, listening to the songs, especially, you know, you just know the dialogue for those particular parts, and you just and you just decide, you know, and you just cut. On a whim, you just recite the dialogue at that point. <laughs> but uh, so, which, which I actually ended up, which I ended up uh, doing when I was with them, um, when I was with one of my friends yesterday. As I, I hadn't seen them for like six months, uh, it's, it's sort of like a recurring thing they do. They uh, they, they do like to test my uh, my music knowledge. They went through a Disney playlist, uh, and then it was uh, Aladdin's One Jump Ahead coming into play. Ah. Uh, uh, so they're going through like the, the small chase towards towards the end of it, and, and I'm just I'm just going like uh, say it's like he's got a sword, you idiots! We've all got We've swords. All got swords. <laughs> yes, and yes, one of the gods is voiced by Jim Cummings. <laughs> because of course he is. Yes, but um, yeah, they say the visuals for me nine nine point five, so close, so close to a ten. Um, I was like, I just, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it. Um, I, th- I think part. I think part of that is just down to me chalking up the, um, the whole, um, the the picture frame thing, the, which, but right. But I th- I think that might therefore come down to a difference of interpretation. Yeah, but they, but that's that's, that's still probably, though nine nine point five is commendable. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I said, I'm actually having to. I'm having to start using like. Uh, I'm having to start using things like 9.5 now because, because uh, we're because we because we're reaching a point where we're going to have several films with the exact same score. <laughs> yeah, which which I'm definitely going to need to start doing when we get to the Renaissance uh, era of um, of films because. Let's let's face it. I wouldn't be too surprised if we have elevens uh, for like the early stages of the Renaissance, especially. I wouldn't oh, be too surprised. But yeah, um, but yeah, the um, but but overall, despite the uh, for, despite from my perspective, a minor continuity error. The visual presentation of the film is really, really well done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um. The uh, the soundtrack got the soundtrack uh, a nine out of ten for me. Um, again, fantastic fantastic score, massive kudos to Henry Mancini for it. Um, let's see the the songs. I say the world's greatest criminal mind that I can get behind. Let me be good to you. I'm okay with. But, um, but I, say, I I just felt as far as the score is concerned. Again, again, like in like in one of my previous episodes, I felt I felt if there was a bit more, if if there was a bit more variety as far as the score was concerned, I would have probably been look, been looking at a ten for it. All right, I I kind of see where you're coming from, but but I say but but apart from that, it is it is it is a fantastic soundtrack all round from the uh, yes fr- from the from the score to the um uh, to the song despite the fact there's only like three of them but, <laughs> yes but they're but they're all they're all three of them are good yeah absolutely and the uh, the legacy of this film definitely gets a nine for me yeah I say, uh, what stops it from getting a 10 is because this is this is this is another case of one of those films that doesn't often get talked about as far mm-hmm. as some of the um, some of the best Disney films are concerned, mm-hmm. uh, m- mainly mainly due to the era it came out in. 
But yeah. But despite that, the way they managed to pay homage uh, to the Sherlock, um, to Sherlock Holmes, which inspired uh, the Basil of Baker Street uh, books, which end up which ended up becoming the film to begin with, it's um, it's a it's a great. I've, I've said it before. It's a great introduction to the Sherlock Holmes formula for the kids, especially. But I see the the way the way the film ended, though. I really wish we got a sequel out of it. I, really, I know. I say. I say the, the the way the way the monologue the way um, uh, the way Dawson was uh, talking about the the uh, the many years that uh, they spent together solving the cases. I would have loved to have seen another. I would have loved to have seen another one of those um, cases. Yeah. Either adapting one of the cases in the books, or maybe even coming up with a brand new adventure. Yeah, absolutely. Or g- g- given 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 what they were just about to do, as far as their TV series was concerned, maybe a TV series. That would have been good. Yeah. That would have been amazing. I mean, I, I would have been absolutely on board with that. Oh, that would have been so good. Yeah. But see, but see the, the opportunity, I mean, dare I say, Disney, the opportunity was right there. Oh. Uh, oh, well. But, but see, but see that, that's like, the, that's the only, that's the only gripe that, that, that's the only negative I have as far as the legacy is concerned, that they didn't take full advantage of exploring more of the uh, Basil of Baker Street stories, making another film, or even making a TV series out of it. Mm. But, yeah, guess we just have to settle with, uh, guess we just have to settle with uh, fan fiction from Disney fans regarding this. <laughs> yes. But- um, there's actually a fan fiction I've been... Uh- meaning to read, which actually delves into the origin story of Basil and Ratigan, how their rivalry began. Ah, okay. I, I think it might be called something like The Professor's Profile or something like that. Interesting. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I'll definitely... Yeah, I might, I might try and... Um, might try I'll send and, uh... you... Um, I'll send you the link when I can find it. Excellent. Looks like... Let's say, so there we go. I've got a... So I've got I've got something I can read for uh, later down the road. So yeah, but say, but say the, the score here it's uh, a nine solid nine. N- yeah, the score for the legacy a nine a nine out of ten. The score overall, taking everything into account, it gets a ninety five percent, which puts it as it stands in the top five. It is in the top five from the films I've reviewed so far. And the rest of that top five comprises of Snow White, Winnie the Pooh, Fantasia, and Sleeping Beauty. Yep, that sounds about right. I say, I say, just just from that alone, that is a very I say, despite this being one of the uh, lesser known animated films that Disney has done. From for this series to be in there in the top five with the likes of Fantasia, Winnie the Pooh, Pinocchio, and Snow White, to be up there with with arguably the elite of the Kingdom of Isolation yeah. so far, that's no mean feat. That's not to be sneezed at. Absolutely. I say 95%. It is top five. I say fifth place in between Snow White and Pinocchio. I say that. I say it's a. I say that's a very strong top. That's a very strong top five. Now that we've got Basil thrown into the mix, as well. So, the way to look at it, folks. If you haven't seen it yet, I would definitely. Well, we would definitely recommend giving this film a watch. Oh Int- yeah. I say introduce it to the kids. I say. I say if 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 they're inter- if if they're somehow interested in Sherlock Holmes. Definitely show them this so that. Mm-hmm. So that can... And if they're not, then maybe this will get them interested in Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, absolutely. Let's say, um, let's say, uh, just over a year ago, actually, uh, I remember doing an escape room with uh, with somebody I was dating at the time, and uh, the, the escape room was Sherlock Holmes, themed, <laughs> where we where we had to help Moriarty find um, 
uh, we actually broke into uh, Sherlock Holmes' uh, uh, apartment. Ah. To, yeah. And the goal was to escape with Sherlock Holmes' hat, magnifying glass, and smoking pipe. Nice. And we did manage to escape it successfully, make, meaning that, and that meant that my 100% record for escape rooms remains intact. Hey. But yeah, that is it for this episode of the uh, Kingdom of Isolation. We've, I've got one more film to do before we get to the Renaissance, which is, of course, Oliver and Company, inspired uh. by Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. That's it, Alan. Thanks very much for thanks very much for joining me once again. I am very much looking forward to having you on board for the Hunchback of Notre Dame. I'm very much looking forward to that too. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, so we'll get to the Hunchback of Notre Dame during the Renaissance over the course of the summer. But uh, as I say the the last episode I've got to do before we get into the Renaissance period uh, is of course Oliver and Company. But until then, we will see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation. <laughs>